I would highly recommend probably the, the, the main networking event for anyone interested in African music, 25 to 27 November in Johannesburg. Thank you. Okay. Anna? Do you have anything to say? Uh, oh, okay, cool. Great. Yes. Um, I will talk about sharing, sharing between uh, festivals. We, we made an experience with um, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, and Benin, and we make one week together to share how we, we with Ladima Foundation, and we, we, we learn how we, we made our film festival, how we made selection, and it was very interesting. But I speak French, I come from French country, and we have a linguistic barrier. I think I'm sure few persons speak French in here, and people who speak English, when they say Africa, they say South Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, they forgot Africa is also Benin, Togo, Senegal, and when we, we say Africa, we think Benin, Togo, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, and we forgot South Africa or Tanzania is also in, in Africa. So I think we need to, to how do you say, <laughs> we need to work. We need to work together. We need um. to, to, to forget linguistic barrier. And I think we, we, we will grow up together and for, for development of African creativity. Yeah, yeah I think that the, the borders come with um, the physical, you know. And I think being on a digital space has made us forget there are borders. Uh, but moving forward, we are all speaking of hybrid events, which means we cannot desert the audiences that we have uh, gained on a, a digital platform for two years. But we still have to have this physical engagement, conversations like this, which are much more different from having a conversation with someone from Benin online. I noticed that earlier on when the two of you came in Monday, it was like, you were part of the jury, you were part of the, of the selection committee for the Encounters Festival, but you only met digitally, but when you met physically, it was all different. You looked all different. And I think um, as much as we have forgotten of the borders, and I think Yusuf has mentioned the divide itself. Now when you have to travel, you need to get your COVID test done. So the list is actually piling up. The divide is growing, you know, as, as, as we are going, you know. So I think it, 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 for me, I feel like um, I know that we, we spoke, also touched on, uh, on the issue of um, sustainability, which is important, you know, as much as people are pulling away. But how then, the most important one, how then do we tap into the corporate space? as creatives um, who are behind creating opportunities for other creators. How do we benefit from the corporate? What is it that we can present to them that can attract them to our spaces? Um, Mandy, do you want to do? That's a tough one for me. Uh, we, because we, I've we been looking at our business door. models now. We're yeah. looking at changing of business models, you know. Yeah. The traditional way is not going to work any further. So we're talking sustainability as much as we can create income for ourselves. But how can we get more? Because the, the industry is growing on a day. Yeah. We cannot say we are servicing 10 people for 10 years. We need to be growing the industry. That's why we're here. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I've been knocking at that door for years and it's a tough nut to crack because they look at return on investment and they want to see huge audience numbers and we're not like the Cape Town Jazz with 100,000 people from yeah. all over the country and the world. So that's the value proposition that they see. Um, I think we need to appeal to the corporate industry on the economic value, the social economic value of supporting the creative industries. Um, the research has been done uh, by various sectors, by various bodies, including the National Film and Video Foundation, our government, that film, for example, is a huge contributor. Mm. Um, and I, I believe we don't want to be a country that only services other industries. We want to be a country that has value in our own creative productions, in our own storytelling products. 
um, and not just a technical servicing industry. And I believe that needs to be the value proposition and the servicing of small businesses, small creative businesses to grow the economy because it's, you know, the stats are there, the creative sector. It, it's got huge potential, it's, it's, it's got huge economic value, and I think the corporate sector doesn't understand it quite well, and we need to learn to speak the language that they speak, and there needs to be an investment into the future and not a quick return on investment, yeah. um, and looking at other countries as an example of what is possible, so that one day when the next generation of creatives come, we've created a, at least a little bit more sustainable environment for them. Cool. Les, do you want to take it? Yeah. That's exactly, being able to understand what corporate needs. Corporate is going to have two main drivers. One is a return on investment. If I'm going to put this money in, what am I going to get out? Two, ESG, environmental, social, those sorts of angles, mm. is another way to approach it. But the, the ability to present, I mean, uh, Yusuf's point of that his, his event costs X and there's a magnitude return to the entire economy. Mm. That's, that's unfortunately the language that needs to be presented to make this event seem credible. Mm. And that's not cool because the, our events are providing value in our own spaces and they can go even further. So as an example here, uh, and I apologize, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Hands up if you think you could earn a decent living playing computer games. Okay, I got maybe <laughs> three, four hands. Cool, there's one double hand up the back. That's really, really exciting. Well, okay. he or so, she is making quite a lot of money yeah. in the back there. Three, three weeks ago, Dota, now you don't need to understand anything of what I'm about to say. Dota is an online computer game where five people sit down and play five other people. They just had their world championships around about two weeks ago. The entire prize pool was 42 million US wow. dollars. The winning team, the My oldest player in that team was 24 years old. The average age of that team was 21. That team took home 19 million US dollars. <laughs> now, if I asked you the same question, do you think you could make a living? Hands would go up a little bit differently. So what I, what I tried to give an example of is the, the fashion industry. The things that go on in the fashion industry I have no idea about, but there's levels of skill and genius and technological advancement there that I'm not aware of. Mm. Documentary film, music, there are all these aspects of all these events, but we want credibility, for, we want money for, and support from corporates, mm. but you need to speak their language. Yeah. So being able to translate your value proposition of your event what return on investment can I get for you? I might only show it to a thousand people, but five of those people could be Netflix executives. And now all of a sudden, it's a different story. So trying to unlock corporate revenues and corporate assistance requires a reframing of the value propositions of the events to be in front of the investors, but as you've mentioned, I mean, even in fashion, and when we were talking about African fashion 20 years ago, it was sort of like, it's a, let's help it for charities, let's uh, you know, help the weavers, let's help the dyers, etc. But when you're thinking 20 years ago, we still haven't built you know, a robust fashion industry in Africa. You don't have household names. We all wear what we can because we know a designer here or there, but why haven't we built that? It's because we haven't endorsed our fashion yet. We are not wearing enough African fashion or African fashion made in Africa yet. So if, if, if we don't start supporting our own industry first and then once the numbers start getting bigger, then the investors will come because it makes business sense for them anyways. When you have 1.2 billion people every day waking up having to make a decision on what outfit to wear, 
And if everybody can make a decision, say 20% of my wardrobe is going to be made in Africa, you can find that sewing machine and they're still not able to sustain their own business. The talent is there, the creativity is there, but we are not supporting enough of our industry. We are creating nice high-level events, fashion weeks and all, which is good, but when you go back and, you know, uh, take the layer off, you know, it's, a, it's an industry that's suffering. It's an industry that's suffering, and yet we have creativity. We have inspired the West. We have, you know, we have certain designers that have had to leave the continent and based in Sabah abroad because mm. they haven't been able to be taken seriously or surviving on the ground. So, mm. you know, at least in our industry, it's obvious. You know, how do you sustain the fashion industry? Go out and buy fa African-made clothing. Mm. You can find everything online. And before, you have to flip through Vogue to see who's making what. But now you can go online with the internet. You know, every mm. major designer or small or up-and-coming designer has um, you know, access to Instagram and Facebook, and if you research enough, you can find really great, wonderful, well-tailored, well-constructed um, um, garments and fashion. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's really how sort of we have to start from within first, yeah. and then obviously you know, find the people who are going to help us write the business plan, or find the people who are going to make the connection. And yeah. most probably, they will come to us as well. We don't need to maybe go there and and make the pitch there because you know the mm. the bottom line will be you know, it's a massive continent with huge yeah. potential, untouched t potential, and so um, you know once we start endorsing and once we start really looking within and supporting our own industries and paying the full rates, why should a s specific rate be less expensive? You know, 20 years later, you know, if if they should be pay paying full rates, you know. Uh, even f within our own, that's how I believe, within, within our, own, our own communities or within our own, um, we, we shouldn't always try to see, okay, if you're coming from outside, you're going to have to cover our expenses or you're going to have to support us. Mm -hmm. We need to support, we're enough of a, a population yeah. uh, across borders to be able to run, uh, you know, all our creative industries ourselves, yeah. you know, and, and manage it ourselves as well. So, I like the fact that you mentioned that um, consume what comes out of the continent just because we don't believe in it. Um, but at the ver very same time, there's quite a lot that we are, very, we are such a creative nation um, and all our creativity is not, is not consumed by us. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about fashion itself, you're asking yourself how many like clothing, like items of God that are, are actually made. Um, should we ask ourselves in terms of why are we even drawn towards um, that, uh, that side? Just before we, we engage further, we just to want to Hi. welcome Pikia, who's just joined us. Um, sorry that we are kind of towards the end of the session, um, but we're going to give also our audiences a chance to actually ask their questions as well. Okay. Uh, so maybe if you can just bring... Uh, Introduce yourself uh, in terms of what it is that you do and how is it that you are contributing to the creative industries. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, sorry for the delay, my flight was sort of late. My name is Bikia Graham Douglas and I'm the festival director of the Beta Arts Festival in Abuja and also the executive director of the Lagos Theatre Festival. And with the festival, with the Lagos Theatre Festival, is focused on theatre, and it's been running for the last eight years. And we've had over 15 countries participate in the Lagos Theatre Festival. And the format is stage plays, and we focus on site-specific um, stage, site-specific theatre, especially with the depression that we saw in um, performing arts in Nigeria and we had to find innovative ways in which we can still have performances but less expensive and that's what we've been able to achieve with the Lagos Theatre Festival. We also have a lot of training for young people. We have, um, we foster exchanges and collaborations. We've worked a lot with the United Kingdom and we're working with some countries in Africa but I'm focused on us expanding that more. As I see that, you said something as I just walked in about how we do not um, consume enough of our own, yeah. and that's the truth. We tend to pander to content and Western theater, but that is changing. 
and that is something we're very focused on achieving at the Lagos Theatre Festival. I just got off the Beta Arts Festival. It, 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 it rounded up on Sunday night, actually Monday morning at 5 a.m. and I got on the plane to be here. Uh, yeah. Easy, hey? <laughs> yes, and with the Beta Arts Festival, it's pan-African focused. And um, even with all the funding for the festival, is coming from the continent. Yeah. All the material from the continent is coming, is, is coming from here. And for the first is, is the inaugural edition, and we had Ethiopia, Ghana, Mauritius, Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa participate. And the Beta Arts Festival, the format is a convergence of different expressions of arts from across the continent, bringing theater, film, music, and mm -hmm. visual and fine arts in the same space, yes. and also having important conversations as to how we can move the African narrative forward, how we can tell our stories in our own voices and push for more collaborations on the continent. We're a purely Afri pan-African festival. So those are the things that I do. Nice. And yeah. when I'm not doing that, actually, I'm an actress. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure if you're all acting that one out, <laughs> or scripted or anything like that, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think I'm excited by the fact that the directors were actually sitting here, actually thinking uh, pan-African, you know. Who's going to push our mandate if we are not doing that? Who's going to be behind our stories mm -hmm. if we are not doing that as ourselves? As much as we are in different, we are using, we are actually in uh, different spaces. We're in film, we're in music, we're in theater, you know, but that means that through the six of you who are actually here, you're focusing on creating content from Africa for Africans, yes. you know, which is very important. You know, so I'm going to give it the floor to the audiences if there's any question they would like, like to ask our panel members. Yes, sir. In the black, yes. <laughs> um, can we get a mic or we need to project? Okay. Oh, it's coming. Oh, here we go. Yes, the gentleman in a black blazer. Yeah. Um, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you so much for, for all the contribution that you, you've all shared. Um, my name is Bo, and I'm a creative at heart. And um, listening to the conversation here and, and seeing this um, expo that we're all a part of always brings a certain question to me, and I, I guess maybe I'm posing the question to you as a panel, but I'd also like to pose the question to anybody else on the floor. You know, um, we've seen so many of these kind of engagements, and we sit here as creatives, and we try and figure out all these things about funding, but why is it that in this exact platform, we do not have the people that are the actual funders of such platforms? Mm -hmm. I mean, we are sitting amongst ourselves as creatives trying to actually figure out how do we get certain people to support us. Why is it that we don't have such people in, in the room? You know, why is it that when we organize these events, we don't think, okay, there are 10 um, funders or certain people that fund even the trade fairs themselves. Mm -hmm. Why is it that when we have these kind of conversations, we don't line them all up as banks, as development, whatever, and actually let them hear these conversations that we're having. Quite because we, we, we're frankly talking amongst ourselves, which has been happening for years now. Yeah, it is yeah a, quite, quite interesting. To actually, sorry, um, if you if I could jump in very quickly. Yeah. Uh, one of the major sponsors of the event, the bank that sponsors the event, uh, we just happen to know we happen to know. We <laughs> happen to us. We uh, happen to know. <laughs> that they're actually in the next hall. In the major hall, they have a very big, large green stand there. Um, and they actually welcomed each of us yeah. to go and have that conversation with them. So at least one entity is here. I just wanted to acknowledge. And they're a key sponsor of the event. So I wanted to give them a shout out that they, they are here and have actually at least opened the first door. But your point about the other platforms out there that might be looking to sponsor creatives, 
Absolutely, it's a, it's a valid point, and I'll, I'll throw that open. Yeah, um, I know I'm, I'm not giving the answer, but it's just a, a thought. I, I agree with you. We have this conversation on our own uh, without having the bodies. I would like for people to have a space where we keep on saying that to tap into the corporate world, uh, get your corporate sponsors, you need to speak the language. What is that language? How am I going to speak that language? So we need to have that sort of mentorship. How do we speak your language so that you can be interested? Mm -hmm. We can tell you exactly what we do, even if you wake us up in the middle of yeah. the night. We can tell you exactly what we do, but we're not speaking it in your language. What is your language? You know, that's another thing that we, we need to look at. How are we creating platforms for us to teach us how mm -hmm. to speak a corporate language? Actually, can I just yeah. add to that as well? Um, yeah, like he said, we pounced on the African banks. <laughs> stakeholder that's here immediately when he introduced him, we're like where can we meet you Is that so yes we pounced on him um, but I think we all know the usual suspects in terms of inter international funding and grants and we're probably applying to the same foundations e.g. the British Council grants and the mobility grants so I think we're well aware of those funds what we need is some kind of database or resource of pan-african funding because I don't know, and I would love to be knowledgeable of that. But I think this, this space is quite unique in that we are in the same space as banks and corporates and funders right now. Yeah. And it's for us to capitalize on that. It's my first time here, and I think this is a resource, and this is quite a unique space for us yeah. as creators, and we need to take advantage of that. Indeed. Can, oh. I, can I just add something? Yes. So um, post-COVID, we're trying to do things a little differently because funding has changed, is limited, as the whole world is affected by it. So for us at um, Lagos Theatre Festival and now the festival, we're looking for innovative ways in which we can still access this funding. And we're reaching out to um, organizations who would not normally fund the arts, and we try to create material that aligns with their scope, so that way we're able to get funds from them as opposed to just the regular channeling of the international grants and all of that. We're trying to now get ad hoc um, funding for our projects because it's very limited. Mm -hmm. And with digital, digital is now an area where we've seen there's robust funding in the digital space. So we're now trying to adapt some of our programs to suit that space so we can access that money to be able to carry on doing our activities. So that's something else that we're doing to find extra funding. Uh, can I take a question, Spamanda? One, two. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Pamanda Ngobo from the non-profit organization called Kumisa. It's more into music, and I'm also a filmmaker. Uh, I think my contribution is in twofold. I think one, it's more onto the policy. I think as creatives, we get into a space whereby there are decisions that have been made as far as the policy and implementing certain things that ends up affecting the creatives yeah. uh, from, from, from our, our, our respective uh, industries. I think that's one, because when you talk about performance, you talk about city bylaws, let, let's use Deben for instance, you can't perform in that space because you need to apply for this particular permit. You can't perform in that space. So, we want to showcase Deben, we want to showcase culture and all the diversity, but there are red tapes that are there due to policy. So there, there are less conversation as far as the creative contributing, in, as far as the policy making that speaks to the creative space. And then the second point I'm trying to make, that I think I believe that, that where the gap is, like for instance, using the show microphone. In almost every stage, there's a show microphone. But when you trace back show, you, you end up in Chicago. And then three cameras in front of me, it's Canon. When you trace back, when you trace back Canon, you end up in Japan. And then when you move forward, you, you, you look at the JBLs. When you go back as far as JBL, you end up in America. But what is Africa doing as far as, yes, we're creative, we have IT people, we have so-and-so departments that are more focusing on to this, Overseas, they use, there's YouTube, there's Spotify, there's X, Y, Z, you name them. They are sent uh, there's certain trends, and then we're following. What 
is it that as African we're creating as far as software development, as far as the equipment that we end up being using? Because we spend so much money buying these brands because they've been in existence for years and they were backed by their own countries. So I think that's where there's another gap that we, I think, I believe that we're missing. Thank you. Cool. There is a question at the back, the lady. And then we, at the back, far back, back. And then after we go to the lady, you did. Okay, it's fine. Start with her. Yeah. No, you, you can continue. Then we go to the lady at the back. Hi everybody, my name is Gabriella. Um, I am a resident here in Durban. I am involved with a variety of different creative elements, predominantly working with youth and developing young talent across all the different sectors. I think it was very interesting some of the ideas that were brought up in this discussion. Um, I really hope that we can find a way of actually taking them forward, that it's not mm -hmm. just a panel discussion, um, but we can actually start looking at what are the actions and the tangibles. Um, I think the idea of circuits, there's a massive possibility there, one with funding, um, but also just sharing of artists. We used to do the Igoda um, music circuit with a variety of different festivals, and that, I mean, there were problems as always, but it worked really well because we were able to share costs. We were able to look at joint sponsorship, so if you're looking at a company that's in a variety of different um, countries, you can actually approach them and say you're getting a larger footprint um, around. So when we're talking about corporates, they like to see what is their footprint that they're able to get. Um, so I would really love to see if we could look at the different industries, how do we look at circuits, how do we look at a, a pan-African calendar to actually understand. So I organize a variety of different festivals Sometimes I want to book an artist or I want to engage with something, but there's something else happening that I didn't know about. But if there's some way of having a consolidated calendar where the major things are on it, it's easier to plan for us. It's mm. easier to sure make it so that the access. So I think the portal idea is fantastic. I don't know how one would go about it, um, but I think it's definitely something we should look at. And we should look at also how do we work with different cities, so mm -hmm. Durban has 17 sister cities, a lot of them are in Africa. How do we gain more access? How do we create it so that there's exchange programs that are easier? Mm -hmm. um, one being visa access, making that easier. So I think there's a series of follow-up things that I think can come from this discussion. I know yeah. we're just starting this whole process, um, but also I'd like to know where can we as participants put forward our ideas for if Canex is happening again, and what is the content that we would like to see going forward with it. Sorry, I know that's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. Okay, we go to the back, then I think we can comment on that after. Good afternoon, thank you. My name is Nanaya, I'm from Ghana, mm -hmm. and I wanted to position two things. I started off as a journalist and now I publish books, mostly on culture and history and arts. Each of the books that I've published, three of them so far, have been sponsored by the corporate sector in Ghana. So I like the idea that you are tapping into how to draw people like banks who are not necessarily allies of culture and history to sponsor books. So I wanted to share that experience that if it suits their interest, as you said, if it speaks their language, they will sponsor. And I think it would be fascinating if um, through this platform, I could find others who are also in the same space, share experiences, but because mm -hmm. it, it has happened. But it's happened only in Ghana, and I like what you said about a pan-African conversation, because Ghana is part of Africa, Africa is part of Ghana. So if there's a way of broadening my experience and yours, I'd like to be part of that. The second thing that you said that um, resonated on key dates, for instance, in August 2023, the Africa Games will be held for the 13th time in Ghana. On the face of it, it's all about sports. But what I have made a pitch at, and I'm very excited to share it with you, is that we should look at the context in which some of our best sportsmen and women 
of the past, of the current, and our future, where do they come from? What is the geography of this country? What's the history of this country? What should we know? So that in the 55 weeks up to the actual launch of the games, each country gets sort of a one-week profile. So really, I came here in the hopes of meeting people from mm -hmm. different countries where we could put that pitch together. So thank you very much for the platform and for your wise words. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anything to add on that as panel members? Do we have any more questions? Yes. Can we get a mic to? Can be a question, can be a comment. Thank you. My name is Nicholas Moyo. I'm from Harare, Zimbabwe. Mm. Just two, two key things, I think, uh, brought by uh, our colleague who is sitting there. I think as Africa, we need to develop clear circuits of festivals in Africa. Yes. Where we can promote our own groups to move around Africa in a particular circuit of festivals that are there. Could it be fashion? Could it be film? Could it be performing arts? Could it be music? Mm. Because we know generally across the world, when we have visiting groups, generally ticket sales become high. Mm. So when we work on a circuit, it means we are building each other to build our brands as African festivals. Yes, yeah. That's the first point. The second point is how do we grow audiences? Mm. It's important that when you work your, your budget, you are clear how much of your budget will come from corporate support. But I think for festivals, it's also very important that you reach a certain threshold as a local festival from ticket sales. Mm. How do we build our people to consume our own arts so that we move away from the tendency of giving away too many complimentary tickets <laughs> and people buy tickets and consume our festival so that when they consume the arts, we are building a good market for the future for our own festivals. Mm -hmm. I think those are my two contributions based on what has just been discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. You actually brought up a, a point of complimentary tickets, and I think that's what we deal with as festival organizers. People are just wanting complimentary mm. tickets. They forget that we also need to sustain the project, and we, the one way to sustain that is via ticket sales. Um, and I think maybe the mindset of our people is that uh, when it's done home, you can get for free, you know? Uh, but when they go overseas, they pay quite a lot of money, so which means they value things that are out of Africa. So we need to find that way of saying, hey, let's value home first. Yeah. Let's value our own first. You know, that's the most important thing that we should be uh, preaching. And that's, I think I'm confident in saying that the panel members today are actually preaching that gospel of Pan-African. Let's all come together. Let's work together. Um, if, I can, if I may say myself, I've been part of an organization. The lady at the back has mentioned that she's here to network. She's here to connect. And this is what we should be doing. Be intentional with your actions. You are here to connect with other creatives within the, the, the African continent as well so that we are looking after ourselves. I must say that for the past year or two, I've been part of an organization that is based in Berlin. But the network, the way that network is growing, it's merely by saying, I know someone who has an interest in the same thing that we are doing. Then we bring them on board. You know, it's, 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 it, it, that's what we should be doing as well with the African continent and say, who in the film space, you know, we can bring in? Let's break down the walls. Like I said, let's break down the walls and bring in more people, because the more we are doing that, we are opening space for more people to come in. We are creating audiences for our events as well. I like the fact that we need to actually put it out there, what events are happening in Africa, 
um, at what time so that we don't have a clash when it comes to our programming. We all feed into each other's uh, festivals as well. Uh, maybe the theater, like I said, maybe music as well as film, but we must find a strategic way. How do we move within the continent from one festival to another? And I'm hoping that as we are all here, we will all uh, network and find uh, the best way to work together. And I can see that is happening at the back, already happening. You can tell you it is already happening. <laughs> and that is the most beautiful thing ever. Yeah. Here's a question and a comment. Can we have a microphone? The gentleman with the cap. Sorry, while, while the microphone's moving over, yes. I'm going to put my head on the block. Yes. I'm going to follow up with Canex to find out what, uh, what registry can be done mm -hmm. as far as events. Because a, a, a few people have asked, it's come up a few times, and it's like, we think this is important, but nobody has said this is what's going to happen. This is what they're going to do. I don't know what will happen. I'm going to try. Uh, I'll speak to Thank you. Thank you, Les. Uh, now we are coming with solutions for ourselves. All right, yeah, the, the nerd's going to see what he can do. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I will reach out to Canex. I'll reach out to fellow panelists. Uh, you network with people from Benin to find other people. This is the, I'll start asking the question, but this is, I'll find out what, the, what Canex's scope is, how far it can help in relation to that sort of knowledge transference, because it and the IATF is going to have a much bigger database. It might be something that should fall under the purview of the Intra-Africa mm. Trade Fair. So mm. I will at least start pushing the ball down, down the lane, see what I can do. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, let me thank the panel for very fruitful discussions, uh, very enlightening. Uh, my name is Theophilus Nyoma. Um, I'm from Namibia, representing the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture. Uh, before I proceed, I want to acknowledge um, the presence of our Minister of Education, Arts and Culture in Namibia, uh, Honorable Esther Anangi Pondoka. Yes. Um, yes, we are talking about funding, creative industry, organizing festivals. Uh, I just want to ponder on the question, like in our respective countries, how have we taken arts and creativity in schools? How rampant is it in schools? Because my thinking is that yes, we are young adults now moving forward, but like those children in schools are or let me say schools are a fertile breeding ground for instilling creativity and harvesting and harnessing creativity in these children from a young age. Because to be honest, they are the future of this creative industry. Mm. How do we harness creativity in schools, in our curricula, in our respective countries? How do we, those who are active in the industry now, how do we link up with schools and you know um, institutions of learning to bring in and to attract and to see that listen from a young age if you follow this industry you can make a decent living how do we become role models you know for these children who want to follow that uh, path of uh, being in the creative industry and i thank you then anyone wants to respond to that I and i think after that we will close because we're running out of time have, we'll have closing remarks I'll, for the panel and we're done okay just very quickly um what we have done in nigeria is for primary and secondary schools with beta universal arts foundation we have a national storytelling dramatized competition for primary and secondary schools and for the last edition, we had over 600 schools participate in it, and we had to come up with a short list for the finale. And we try to um, mentor these kids and work with them, and we get them to actually produce by themselves, and we just supervise what they do. Then when it comes to the upper level to university, we have the beta playwright competition for Nigerians between the ages of 18 to 40. And the winning play from the competition is produced by university students we give university students the creative arts department a grant and they have to produce this place and this is just something that we are doing but I agree with you that we can do so much more in that space to develop talent from a young age 
And I would just like to add, festivals are a meeting point. Yes. And for us who are um, directors and conveners of festivals, we have to be intentional mm -hmm. about including pan-African programming for our festival. Yes. And with the Beta Arts Festival, including films from different countries, we never, Nigerians don't really consume other African content, but we saw them pay money to watch these films and yeah. they really enjoyed it. It was a trial and we could see that it worked. So we have a responsibility to be intentional about pushing Pan-Africa forward. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, members of the panel, we can no longer have uh, a discussion or goodbye notes. It can be a brief one second bye-bye to the audiences. <laughs> and however, this session has not ended, guys, in a way that we are going to continue having these conversations throughout the summit. It may not be necessarily on this platform, but we still have spaces where we can all meet up and talk about this movement that we are pushing in our respective festivals. So thank you so much to our audiences. Thank you to the organizing team. And thank you to this, Bikia, Nigeria, Yusuf, Anna, um, Mandisa, Cornelia and Les, thank you so much for coming through, for contributing. May you have a great day ahead of networking. Thank you so much. Thank you. Birra, 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 birra.
Ladies and gents, if I could please have your attention. We are about to start our next session, which is a session I'm actually very excited about. Um, the panelists on this session are incredible. But just to go back to what we were talking about in terms of festivals um, in the creative space after COVID. Thank you. <laughs> after COVID, I think one of the things that we've realized is that we've had to adapt. We've had to find innovative ways to continue doing the things that we're doing because we have been compromised um, from this pandemic. And I think those were some of the discussions that we heard our panelists talking about. We heard them speak about the fact that we need to unify ourselves. We need to find a, a central hub for us to be able to identify all the different festivals that exist on the African continent for us to be able to support one another, grow our industries more. Um, and I was so excited about that first chat. And if the first chat was anything to go by, this chat is about to get even better. So for our next session, are you guys ready for me at the back? With more creatives across the continent looking to succeed in the music industry, our next panel of experts from various spaces in the music sector, the creative content specialists, independent labels, and major record companies will break down the music ecosystem chain, as well as the economic supply chain that makes music happen. Kindly welcome onto stage our next facilitator, who is Antar Stella, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Content Connect Africa. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I think I'm sure people have gone to take a break. It's all good. Um, welcome. 
My name is Anto Stella. I am currently the CEO of Content Connect Africa. We have a little stand at the back with a fabulous young team there. Um, this, particular, uh, this, this particular subject is one that is close to my heart. So I'm gonna, while everybody's settling down, the topic is navigating the music industry. And I'm gonna show my age but I've been navigating this industry for 37 years, when it was still cassettes and vinyl. Um, so you can imagine as we have navigated, we have moved. This industry is probably one of the most resilient, I think it's the only industry I know, but it is the most resilient industry when it comes to changing formats. And I mean, I probably am looking at all of you um, in this, in, in this in this auditorium, and you're all young, so maybe you don't remember vinyl. Um, but we have changed. We did cassettes, vinyl, and we've moved to street CDs, DVDs, interactive CDs, and music, and then finally streaming. And in the streaming and with COVID, we found the industry has to be resilient and challenged as it is. Um, and, and talking to my colleagues backstage, and I must tell you, I'm in, I'm in the company of giants in the music industry. I have to say that, again, I want to see more women in the industry. Um, it's, gonna, it's my message right now that we have to see more women coming up in the music industry behind the scenes. But that's for another subject I'm going to talk about later. Um, he's not around. He's not making his way here, so I will introduce him. He will join us. Um, I am checking to see if the rest of my panel is ready. Okay, the next guest that I may introduce you, and guys, I'm not gonna do this whole introduction because I'm gonna allow the team to introduce themselves, um, but you will know and be familiar with a lot of these names. Um, the next person is Sipo Dlamini, who is CEO of Universal Music Group Africa. Sipo's been in the industry for a very long time. Welcome, Sipo. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Let's do a round of applause. Um, next is, let me see who's up next here. Uh, <laughs> Odu. Uh, now I'm going to, forgive me if I get the pronunciation of your surname, Makori, founder of Chocolate City Group Nigeria. I have so much love for this man. He's built such an amazing brand. I hear and then, of course, possibly he may not need any introduction, but he is fundamentally someone we should all be talking to, and he's going to guide us through the industry and navigate what's happening, is Alex, of course, the Managing Director of Emerging Markets in Europe, the Middle East, YouTube. Welcome, esteemed guests. I mean, thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to now take a seat, and we're going to have a conversation it's a very interactive conversation. We have some guidelines. Um, so I am going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves a little bit, in a little bit more detail than I have and talk to us currently about what you're, what you're doing in your industry, and we'll go from there. Welcome, James. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So well, where should we start? Alex. Okay, so I'm sitting here with guys <laughs> that have got beefs, right? So I'm going to start with Alex. <laughs> So, um, hello everyone, thanks for being here. My name is Alex Okosi. Um, I now currently work at YouTube. I'm now our managing director for uh, the emerging markets within EMEA, so markets such as Africa, which of course I'm excited to still be, to, to still be part of, um, uh, Middle East, Turkey, Russia, Israel, so all the incredibly growing and fast growing markets within uh, what we call EMEA. Um, I have been, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I would say I've been in the music industry, but I've been in the music space um, for you know, quite some time, given my history of uh, working at MTV and being able to sort of launch our business on the continent with MTV Base, um, BET, and, and all the other music channels that we also launched as well. So excited to be here um, in my new capacity to talk to you about how important the music industry is on the continent. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everybody. A round of applause. Yeah, so hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Aldu Mikuri. How are you? There's no energy, guys. This is music. How are you? Anyway, um, 
a pleasure to be here. My name is Aldu. I'm an attorney. Um, I've worked in music for about 17 years. Started a company called Rock City. Yeah. I think my mic. Um, can you hear me now? Can everybody hear? Yeah, so uh, started a company called Chocolate City about 16 years ago. Uh, that is now going to be a company for vertical. So we worked in esports, in music, in publishing, and now in an agency as well. Uh, but beyond that, I'm also, you know, pivoting into film because I understand that content is a way to change perceptions and to empower young people. So it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, uh, Sifo. Thank you, Thanks. Mr. Zamini. I'm sorry, uh, good I'm morning, so everyone. short. I'm trying to lean back here, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, the chairs are a bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sipo Zamini. I'm the CEO of the Universal Music Group SA, South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So I look after all the English-speaking markets on the continent. Um, I also sit on the board of RISA, the Recording Industry of South Africa, the board of SAMPRA, which is the South African Music Performing Rights Association, and Angel Foundation with ANTOS, which is a foundation that's trying to assist musicians during this tough time in COVID. Um, I also chair the Global Committee for Universal Music Group's Task Force for Meaningful Change, through which in the last 12 months we've supported organizations across Africa in Kenya, Senegal, Nigeria, South Africa with over about 250,000 US dollars. That's me. Thanks. Wow. Thank you. So there I go when I say we're, so I'm sitting amidst giants in the industry who have been very resilient and instrumental in navigating the music industry. I, so, I, I mean, Sipa, I'd like to kind of really start, I mean, maybe on this side okay. and discuss it's not controversial, but let's discuss what the major record company's role in navigating the music industry moving forward. I mean, we're in a, an industry that is changing. Mm. We, we've had probably the toughest 18 months that the industry's seen, particularly for the artists, I mean, the creators. What role are, do you see the majors playing in this ecosystem that is changing completely? I mean, breaking it down, we were talking backstage. What, what do you see the role? Because I know that you're very instrumental in building the business in, across the continent. Yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, for us, what we've always been trying to work on even before COVID is playing a role within the whole ecosystem of the entertainment industry. So we don't see ourselves just as a record label in the traditional sense yeah. um, because we don't just record and distribute and market music. We're also involved in the live business, for example. So yeah. we look at doing bookings for artists and producing concerts and festivals for artists. And that's artists that are not only signed to us, but just artists in general. So our label, our live business is label agnostic. We don't yeah. care what label you're signed to if you're not signed to us. I could um, sign to, yeah, any yeah. artist can sign to you. Correct. I mean, an example of how big that business was for us is in 2019 pre-COVID, out of the South Africa office alone, we booked talent into 965 shows in that one year. Whoa. So wow. that's just, just South Africa. So that, wow. that's the one side. Yeah. Um, we've obviously also got a brands division. So yeah. that brands teams, UMGB, they look at opportunities for artists and their music in the brand sector. So whether it's with brands like Unilever or Coca-Cola or any type of brand, how we get music and artists into that okay. space and look for sponsorship deals and endorsement deals and also sync opportunities. Okay. Um, and then over and above that, we're also looking at content. Uh, you know, as yep. Audi said, um, it, it, it is about how people are consuming content. Uh, music is content. So whether it's, you know, music, film, short TV <laughs> series episodes or live concert recordings, that is another area that we're focusing in. But we just believe that it's important that we participate in the ecosystem, ecosystem. because yeah. when one thing is not generating revenue for the artist, something yeah, else has to generate revenue. Yeah. So you can't rely on just the one, the one element. 100%, thank you. I think that that's really, really important because I also want to come and talk. I mean, we, we, we spoke in, in terms of Chocolate City, but I think that it's really, really important. And I think we noticed this during COVID if artists and creators have multiple streams of revenue, it has been, because there has been no live 
um, industry. Yeah. It's been able to maintain them and to keep food on the table. And if there are any artists or creators in, in, this, pen, uh, uh, in this hall today, it's something that I really think that you should really consider when, you consider when you're expanding your business. But going over to, I mean, again, as I mentioned, I'm going to skip quickly to, to you, Alex, on YouTube. Um, obviously, YouTube is, has a massive impact no, uh, not only in the music industry, but anybody who's creating content. Um, and I have, like, you know, recently, first of all, just in research, kind of looked at YouTube and its impact across Africa. And I wanted to ask you if you could talk to me a little bit about that, because we've noticed that a lot of artists are not making use of or not getting themselves a user YouTube channel, and there are third parties that are uploading the content. And so I just wanted to, like, get your... What your, your feel is that, and how do we navigate that as an artist? Look, I think, you know, it's such a huge opportunity, right? When you think about, you know, what excites me about our platform is how, how the scale of it is actually yeah. incredible. Um, Two billion people yeah. have access to YouTube Phenomenal. on a monthly basis. 500 hours of content is uploaded on YouTube every minute, wow. right? Um, we now have 50 million subscribers as part of our, our premium service. Um, if you look at that and the intensity of that, you realize that there's such a massive opportunity for artists to make sure they lean into YouTube. Um, we, you know, last year alone, because of COVID, we saw the lean-in, right? With no events, no things happening, people really lean, leaned into the digital space, and we saw that as well. Um, you know, 100% uplift in terms of the people that are making, you know, seven figures in terms of from, from YouTube on the continent, both in Nigeria and in South Africa, right? Um, and when you think about that, also the number of subscribers has gone up tremendously. You know, we have now 500 channels with at least 100,000 subscribers in South Africa, I mean Nigeria, and then 250 in South Africa. So the, the potential is massive, and I think that, you know, you know our key objective, and if you, you know, if you speak to uh, Leo Cohen, who, who set a vision for us for YouTube, um, who's our head of mu uh, music globally, is to be the single biggest contributor of revenue to the industry by 2025, right? Um, and that's, that's a lot of money uh, to be paid out. And, you know, of course, we're excited to work with the industry, the artists, and, you know, uh, um, and the labels to make sure that we realize that potential. I think that, you know, artists, to, you know, to date, are starting to understand that potential. When you think about it, the top 25 um, artists that are viewed on YouTube, 70% of their views come outside of Africa, right? So that's, you know, YouTube offers you that global reach that's unprecedented. And with that global, global reach means that your channel on YouTube doesn't just benefit from, if it's our AVOD sort of proposition with advertising revenue, it's not just benefiting from advertising revenue that you can get from the continent. It's also benefiting from advertising revenue that you can get from outside the continent. So it's just a tremendous opportunity. I think that for us, we're always ready and, and, and prepared to speak to artists, the labels, and trying to get them to understand how to lean further into YouTube. You know, for me, I, again, I am, I am a little biased because I think the platform is incredibly powerful, but I think that as African artists who have always championed from day one, they need to leverage every single platform they can to be able to monetize in this space because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that's going to be able to fuel their creativity moving forward. So that's, you know, that's kind of how I see it. I'm going to come back to you because I don't think I actually really wanted to talk to you about your background and your introduction. But let me come to you. Now, I mean, we're speaking to uh, Chocolate City, which was originally an independent and is still an independent label, right? Um, yeah. Out of Nigeria, the biggest. Um, certainly, it's been during my career a label that I've watched with great interest because you've had such an amazing, I mean, you've you had some, so many amazing artists come out of Chocolate City. but. Um, uh, can you give us some introduction to you, your background, and I mean, I, I was really interested in terms of the navigation, uh, uh, and this is the subject, is navigating the industry, that you're moving into other content, so. Yeah, um, so, let's just say that I was a very, I was a field rapper, right? I, I used to rap when I was younger, uh, clearly with little success. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So decided to, and this, this is word for most people, I, I tell you that if you're passionate about something, you can actually just um, 
channel that passion in another way. So we don't all have to be musicians or rappers or singers. There are people who can manage uh, talent and who can promote. And um, basically how I got involved in music itself was um, as a young, young lad, my, my father got us a, um, a keyboard and then we had a music teacher so I knew how to play the keyboards and connect this and that. Uh, and, but as I grew older, w one of the things that I saw in Nigeria in particular was that there's so many talented people, but they didn't have a platform. Now, at that time, YouTube was a dream. Let's be honest. Uh, yeah. Being signed to Universal was like, you know, seventh heaven, right? But that is happening right now. That shows you just how much the industry has grown. Is that right now we have some of the biggest artists generating 70 to 80% of their income from a place in Lagos. Oju Elegba, from the streets of Durban. People are doing that, and I think that's the beauty of the... Now, the music industry is changing very rapidly. I'll be honest, I've, I've run a label for 16 years. It was only over the past three and a half years that, as a label, we're actually making money from streaming or from the sale of records themselves, because there was piracy, as you well know. So if... if and, and let me give you context. In, in Lagos, uh, a, a CD... Do you guys know what a CD is? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> right. So a CD was being sold for 200 naira. Now, to, to convert that, that's probably less than 50 cents yeah. at the time, right? But then you could also buy a blank Sony CDR rewritable disc for... Uh, we weren't making any money off of that at all. And for the first time over the past five years, people are making money because technology with streaming has disrupted the disruptors who were pirates and things like that. So I think that's sort of the, the, the path. But where's music going right now? We have to start thinking about what the metaverse means, right? Um, it's big English, and I'm sure Alex understands that better than any other person. But what does that mean for us? It means that NFTs, it means that music becomes an interactive form. It means that there's also different revenue channels across the music. I mean, what that, stream, that, that, that song is, is no longer about one person, it's about multiple rights. It's about how those rights are managed and how you monetize that. Finally, I think the most exciting thing that's happened over the music industry, I mean, over the past few, we've seen local artists breaking global sounds. Yeah. Um, one of the artists that we worked with, a guy called CK, I'm sure you probably heard the song, biggest song this year probably. Um, I, like, we, I, I like how he mentions that casually, like it's very a big deal. <laughs> very just, casually. Has I, casual. just, just to give you context about his artist, he, um, his artist currently has more followers on Spotify than Beyonce does. So, I, I didn't know that. Did you know yeah. that? <laughs> I didn't even know that. I'll, I'll send you the screenshot. So wow. very, very successful. I think we should give him a round of applause yeah. on that Thank achievement. You, yeah, but I mean, for, for me, I think what's exciting about that is that there's no... It's just a kid putting out good music. And what that shows us is that if we put our best foot forward... The world is ready for our music. It's yeah. ready for our content. It's ready for you brilliant young people. You just have to put yourself out there. And with powerful platforms like Google, the big labels, uh, Connected Africa, we can, you know, we can make millions and also feed our, con uh, our families and generations to come. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think we're going to dig a little bit deeper too now. So I wanted to go. I'm going to go back to Alex. I mean, obviously, YouTube is a phenomena that, that everybody's getting into and and now we have TikTok, probably not the right to have on this No, you can have any of But um, I, again, when we went into, and it's, it's part of this conversation about navigating, and I'm going to talk personally. When I, when I started navigating this whole YouTube, because it's, oh, it's just kept on talking to us about YouTube, YouTube, and then we had to get verified, and then people needed to get verified to get onto YouTube. And we started seeing, when we started digging deep, and I, I mean, I use an example, whether it's a Lucky Dube or somebody, and I mean... We see that everybody's uploading content, right? I mean, if I've got footage of Lucky, I can upload that content. But I'm trying to navigate in this process who earns the, the money, right? Mm -hmm. And then I get, and there's some record label or some content aggregator or someone who's uploaded it from somewhere. And then they're collecting. And, and, and so I just want to have, I just want to, maybe help you ask me you to just help us navigate or maybe it's it's something that is still an issue in the industry that does need to be resolved because in the sense I felt like the artist and the composer and the creator were getting the smallest part of the pie right 
And it's a challenge that I have from Content Connect's perspective. We're trying to cut out a lot more th middle parties. I'm sure that, you know, I know with the majors, they're getting more involved in platforms and aggregation. So with YouTube particularly, uh, I, will, I mean, I've, how do you navigate that? How do you deal well, with that? I, I you get lots of court cases. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I think that's what's amazing about YouTube as a platform is that it does allow you um, if you want to be active in it as the, as the intellectual property owner or the, or the content owner, to be able to make sure that you can actually, you know, control that, right? Now, again, if you own the rights to, to, to a piece of content, um, there's, we, have, we, have, we, we have our content, ma you know, matching tools that enables you to actually request for that content to be pulled down, right? If you're not the owner happen. of it. And it does happen, right? So, you know, you know CPO can probably tell you, because I'm sure they have a lot of, you know, because it's, it's going to be easier for them to tell you because if I'm telling you, it's going to be like, ah, oh, I don't know about that. Yes, there's a lot of content that gets uploaded onto YouTube, but again, if you, that's what's great about YouTube. You can put up your content. Um, you can utilize our content matching tools to be able to make sure that you protect your intellectual property so that if you, there's content on there that is, that is your content, you can then be able to go into your studio and be able to request for it to be pulled down and you know, and the platform will sort of run a match and be able to pull that down. Now again, it has to be your content, um, and in terms of you applying for it for that to happen. So that's sort of what enables you to do that, and that's sort of some some of the things that also the labels enjoy because it yeah. gives them an opportunity to be able to protect their rights um, on the platform. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, it is something that you as a as as a content owner need all day long. And who are you going to catch? Yeah. It's not going to be the guy in Alabama markets because at some point <laughs> you started partnering with the pirates so that you can get your content out yeah. there much faster because no, they had a better distribution model. Africa's biggest challenge when it came to the music distribution space has always been there is no infrastructure to distribute music. Yeah. And I think that is what's great about platforms like ours because that is that platform that will enable you to distribute your music and get your music streamed or downloaded you know, without you being worried about it being pirated. So I think that's, that's what technology brings to the space that I think will enable African talent to participate in this growth that we're seeing and this excitement, not only about music in general, but African music. You know, when, you, when, you, when you talk about the impact that African artists are having today, you know, when I started with MTV, trying to make sure that we can at least get our content to travel within Africa and to travel globally, distribution was always the challenge. How do you make sure that the labels, the artists, are able to earn money beyond the concerts they play, yeah. that they're able to actually get revenue? As Audi talks about, this is the first time he's actually getting real money because that distribution path didn't exist before. So that's the value of platforms like ours in that it does enable you to actually to protect your intellectual property at the same time to be able to monetize on the platform. Thank you, Alex. So but, but Sipo can probably back it up. Yeah, if, if I was just yeah. I think one of the things that's really amazing about the YouTube platform, number one, is that you don't need a credit card to subscribe to the service. Yeah, right. And that's why I think across the continent, it's been such an important platform for music, um, musical content creators, right? The other thing is that the, 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 the content management system in the back end is extremely smart, right? So give an example of, of Aldo's case where everybody is uploading videos of them dancing to CK's song. Yeah. CK will still earn the money. So even though somebody else uploads a video, the moment it has its song on the back, the system recognizes that this song belongs to that artist and that whatever money is generated by advertising or, or, or however money is generated on the YouTube platform, it flows to the right person. And the, and the okay. person also has the opportunity to say, I don't actually want that yes. person to have Correct. that content, earn that money, okay. I want it to be pulled out. Uh, I, I agree. The, the thing is, is when you're with a major record label, they have systems in that place, right? I don't think that a lot of the independent record labels, aggregators that they're using, are doing that. But I don't, um, I don't well, agree, Anton. I don't agree. Because, 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 oh, wait, let, 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 let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. You as an individual upload content, right? Yeah. The moment that CK has uploaded the content and said, this is my song, it doesn't matter if somebody else uploads the content and doesn't acknowledge CK. The system acknowledges CK automatically. Yeah, but, but you're talking about people who 
And I, I, I've got examples, and I mean, this is not a point at YouTube. I think it's uh, that I'm no. we're navigating through the parties. Sure. So I have an aggregator. I am an aggregator, but I have to aggregate through a, a, a let me say, orchard in grooves, whoever it is, right? right? Yeah. Then I'm th that person is aggregating on my behalf to YouTube. Well, not even on my behalf to YouTube. Those rights are supposed to be locked in through that aggregator. Maybe not through that label. But my label, I'm aggregating, say, through in grooves, and I'm upload. So there are a whole lot of people uploading content, but there's a third party. I know it. It's a perfect example now of lyric videos that are going up through a third party. And when you go down, you say, who are these people? Take the stuff down. They say, no, but they've been cleared through them, and the artists themselves don't know that that person is uploading the content. So you're no. claiming the content. So I'm, say I'm not saying that you're not taking the content, but... I'm going to now, as the artist and the composer, have to go through this whole cycle, and then when it comes back to that, what is my revenue in that? Uh, of course, there's so many third parties. No, so, so that's, that's not my understanding, right? If you but you're compose, universal, if, if, so I think universal. No, no, I'm, 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 saying, I'm saying as an individual, yeah. right? If you've composed a song, and you upload that song to YouTube, and you claim it, yeah. right? YouTube recognizes you as the composer of that I'm song. Not, I'm, I've gone through two parties. Why would you go through two parties? Because, I, because I've got a catalog. I've got, I have to, let, let, me use, let me use this example so it oh, makes it a little bit yeah. clearer. So, it's not an argument, right? No, it's not an argument. Oh, no, no, <laughs> I want to use an example that is probably, and it's a name that is common to everybody, an example that is Lucky Dubé. I mean, I traveled with Lucky, and I mean, worked with Lucky Lady Smith Black Mombasa, and I tracked, so we, we know that Lucky's content is up on YouTube, yep. but there are people that have uploaded content and you, when you've, uh, that, that are people we don't know. So we're trying to get them to take it down, find out someone to take it down, because there's somebody that's got lyric videos, there's 10 million, um, 10 million um, views on I've Got You, Babe, but nobody has uploaded that. Other people have uploaded that content, right? Okay. So as the, the, the person oh, that no. is, because I mean, obviously, Lucky Maisel, rest in peace, is no longer with us, I say, who is this third party that's put this stuff up? And the aggregator says to me, well, we don't really know because the, the, we just put it up, but we're collecting it. And then I'm saying, okay, so how do I actually, what is my earning out of it? Because I don't know these people. I haven't given them permission to upload the content. Am I making it clear? Am I getting it? So, am yeah, I understanding so, so the could, I, could I say something, right? Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I'm the small fish here, right? Yeah, I'm I mean, the, I'm very I'm, small I'm, fish too. I'm no, I'm a smaller fish. I mean, you're probably like a whale, I'm a, like a, yeah. you know, <laughs> tilapia or something like that. <laughs> but, 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 but just in practical terms, right, we need to educate ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. For every platform you, you, you use, you need to understand the underlying conditions of working. Because ignorance is not an excuse, right? 100%. Agreed. And that's why you need attorneys in everything you're doing with intellectual property. Trust me, it's the most important investment you can make because... He's an attorney, by the way. Yeah, I was, I was pitching. I was pitching. Uh, so you're selling his business. I, I was pitching. But, 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 but no, but seriously speaking, I understand what you're saying, right? I'm talking about personal little account, not, not official one. You upload the content, you do the, um, what do you call it, the metadata. Correct. And it's recorded. So automatically you have a, when you go to the panel, behind the panel, you can see monetize or not, yes. claim or not. All those things are there. It's, it's quite simple. Now when you go to the third party, yeah. right, it gets a bit complex because they might be dealing with several people. But yeah. in, in, indeed, if you have the right uh, uh, documentation, it should be quite easy to, to resolve. So I would say, I mean, the last thing I want to say, <laughs> ah. Hey, hello, hey. everybody, welcome, Esquido. Welcome. Hey, welcome, Esquido. Yay, thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. The, the, the last thing, uh, the last point I want to make, however, and this is not a, a, a campaign for YouTube, but it is. I've met several artists who learned how to produce on YouTube. They learned how to produce on YouTube alone, right? So there's no doubt that it's a very valuable platform, yeah. but it's how you use it and how you educate yourself as to how best to you know, get value from the platform. So, uh, Alex, big ups to you. So, sorry, so it's just, um, yeah. just on that, because I want you to answer that question. Welcome officially, Oskido. We're getting into, like, the meat of a conversation. So uh, the one thing in this research mm. is that I found that a lot of artists have not 
created their own YouTube channels. They rely on aggregators okay. or labels to create their YouTube channels, right? Mm. Because they don't know that they can or they think that it's complex. So I know you're going to all say this, but I have to talk to you about the majority. We represent maybe 2,000, 2,500 artists and labels of those on YouTube channels. And the other people are doing lyrical videos, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I want to, I mean, just, sorry, Alex, I'm going to come back to you if you don't mind. I want you to just welcome Mosquito before we're all jumping in. Uh, Esquido, yeah, 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 is representing <laughs> us as independents. Kalawa Jasmine, I mean, he has an incredible history of not only creating a hugely successful record label, but as a producer and an artist himself. And Esquido, we're busy talking about the uh, poor Alex. It's what really wasn't no, supposed to focus on exciting. YouTube. <laughs> we're talking about um, the, the the different layers of people within the in the chain and navigating that from an artist perspective and particularly right now we're talking about youtube and i'm saying a, a kind of a little bit of research and some experience that i have is that a lot of artists don't have their own channel mm. so they often come to us ah we put something we see some things on youtube we didn't give them anybody permission and it's an education thing i think it does come back to that and maybe that's where youtube can get a little bit more involved is from workshops and maybe you do alex but um, I want you to know your experience before Sipa comes at me from a universal <laughs> perspective. <laughs> so welcome. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, apologies, I mean, for being late. It was just some logistical issues. But I think what's important is that we, uh, it's now in the longing, uh, I mean, learning process. I mean, I, I've known, you know, uh, you, Antos, I know Alex, I know Sipo, and I haven't met my brother here, but, uh, I mean, we come from the era, especially with Antos, uh, where... Being the oldest. You know, we started from uh, what the biggest things was cassettes, and then from there it was physical. I mean, we went into CDs, and right now this is a digital age, which uh, I think has been difficult for all of us, for us to understand, but this is where the world is. So then when it comes to YouTube, I mean, uh, it's funny. I'm discovering things every day, you know, as I take, take along, even with me being in the music industry. But I think uh, talking about the artists having their own channels, uh, we work with uh, a lot with Universal, and they have helped us to say, guys, each artist must have its own channel. So they they help us to make sure that, you know, all those things are done properly for the artists. But at the end, uh, uh, I've always argued, uh, say, with uh, the guy who runs Universal and say, but it leaves us uh, the label, you know, like Galawa Chesme, then where do we belong in this pie in terms of how do we start representing ourselves? Because we've got the artists. Remember, we can push the artists we put, but later, which means when they leave the label, you know, they are going with their own stuff. So therefore, we as a record label, how do we also get to have our own channel? So therefore, we are learning things every day. And for me, uh, I only started focusing on my channel now, and I've started uh, uploading my own things besides music. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, and I've found it that it's a... I'm on radio right now. After I started, uh, I started this thing. It's called Joyride with Oskido. There's about four or five episodes which I've uploaded there. And my channel, I think I had uh, close to about, say, 40,000 uh, subscribers. But within wow. six, six weeks and consistent posting of that uh, Joyride with Oskido, uh, and also I've got the mixes which I'm putting, it's called Legend Live. My channel has grown. I think I'm, I'm close to about 92,000 uh, you know, subscribers. Wow. And I had to call uh, one guy who's done it well in South Africa. His name is Mark G. I'm sure you guys have you've seen yeah. him. And I was asking him on Sunday, he came to my house. And for me, I was surprised that I don't need to be on radio. Mm. You understand? I can use my YouTube as my channel to do whatever I want. So for me, I think it's a great initiative uh, 
we need to understand more. So now I'm trying to understand. And he was showing me, hey, this is how you can monetize. And he went to my channel. He says, oh, you've already got uh, 3,500 rands. I say, wow, you know, because he did it for me. And I didn't know that, you know, YouTube can pay me properly, you know. So therefore, it's very, very exciting. And also, it has become the virtual radio stations. Remember that in our territory, radio doesn't play as much role as they used to be. Mm. But right now, all the songs for them to be big, you need to put them on YouTube. Mm. You know, uh, and I've gone in to even to argue, uh, you know, because I, I always want to talk to my, because uh, we work with uh, majors, we are independent, but we work with Universal. To say, guys, this is what the guys are doing. They are breaking songs on YouTube. But as Universal, if I've got my content, my content gets blocked. So how do I do it then? You understand? Yeah. Because they've got exactly. arrangement with DSPs, and then it's affecting me. When I see Gabs are this small, he's posting his thing, but his song, before it goes anyway, it's already popular. Yeah. By the time it hits the market, after a certain thing, I mean, uh, Dem Tuda song, Jola, he leaked it on YouTube. Mm. But when the song hits the market, it was number one already on all the DSPs via YouTube. Mm. But they explained to me that, you know, the best thing to do is that if you want to do that, let's register your song properly. Right. So whoever is uploading it for you so that you can start earning money from day one. Mm. The fact that you do it and then from there you have, say, f a million subscribers without doing it properly, you lose that revenue. Mm. So rather... Uh, so right now, we're working with Universal for me to say, guys, I'm going to release this song. But right now, I think there's got to be an understanding with DSPs like Apple, Spotify, and all that to say, guys, if YouTube can break songs for me, I don't need radio anymore. Mm. You understand? That's how I've looked at it. So there's got to be understanding that we can give it exclusive to YouTube, yeah. of which, Sipo, that's my argument, which you need to start talking to Apple, Spotify, and all that, because that's, it has become, because right now, if you want your song to be played on big radio stations, people want money, there's payola, you have to bribe someone, but YouTube, who do I bribe? There's no one, there's I just problem. put it up, and it's up there. You've taken out a whole layer of people. Yeah. Thank you, Esquito. So yeah. I think that, if Esquito, I know that we're going, we guys, we're going to be running out of time, but I think this is very important, because I, I think that, that Esquito has really resonated with what I was saying in terms of navigation, and again, it's great to have Universal that can help you and teach you and guide you yeah, because yeah, yeah. they have all the experience. A lot of artists, a lot of emerging artists, which is who we represent as emerging artists, breaking artists, don't have that education or understanding. And, and, yes. and we even as peers, someone for, been in the business a long time, navigate it and understand is exactly how do we get... How do we navigate that? So, I mean... And you know what? We're, we're doing a lot of workshops, and we're, we're doubling down on that, because there's that education, right? So I think a lot of... You know, the reason I, I kind of stayed quiet was that it was such a great opportunity to actually have the industry speak. Mm. Yes. And not because they're friends of mine. Trust me, because these are the hardest guys to deal with, you know. <laughs> um, but, but, the, but the point... And it's not because I'm here. I know that for sure. But it's, it was better for me to be quiet, because they're the ones, right? Because if I said whatever I said, you would have thought it was me just defending YouTube. Yeah. But to your point, the smaller artists, the younger artists, the ones that are up and coming, that don't, maybe don't have label, label representation, they still can do the same thing. But you're, you're absolutely right. One of the things we're trying to now do is have more scaled workshops. We do have them. Fantastic. Um, you yeah. may not be aware of them, but, but to do them more yeah. and more as we grow. But it's a journey, and it's a process. Yeah. I, I truly believe that there's no way that the industry doesn't benefit immensely from this us being the biggest mm. contributor to the music industry in 2025, there's no way that African artists cannot. You just need to see the music. You yeah. need to see what's going on when I'm a piano today on Afrobeats. Yeah. Just see sort 100%. of the explosion. And I think that's what's exciting. Yeah. Because again, whether it's a subscription model or the advertising piece that Oskito's talking about, it's not just about this music earning you advertising revenue from Africa. Yeah. Wherever this music travels through and there are Lovely. viewers watching it, those advertising revenues from those markets are also something that gets to the creator. So again, that's the power and the beauty of this is African talent being able to get that global exposure and the opportunity to also be able to monetize globally. And to me, that's, that's, what we, that's what's exciting, but you're absolutely right. There's, 
there's a whole bunch of Person education that needs to go in, you know, go into the, you know, into yeah. the ecosystem for people to understand how to navigate it. But what's really is exciting is that it's not a platform that you put your content up and it gets pirated and you can't do anything about it. You definitely can. And I think it's, that's kind of what the message is, 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 is all about. Uh, if I can say, um, Antos, first yes, of all, sorry, sorry, uh, everybody, to please welcome going. to the YouTube panel, <laughs> a, a YouTube uh, panel. But it, I just wanted to say a couple of quick things um, that Oskido raised and that Aldo raised as well. Um, first of all, to Oskido's oh. point, there always has to be continuing dialogue and conversation to navigate the changes in the music industry. Because things are changing so fast we have laws that were maybe set in contracts five years ago that are irrelevant now, or that don't apply, or that we need to update because things have changed. The way that people are consuming content, and to Oskido's point, at one point people used to break songs on radio. Now they're breaking songs on YouTube, or they're breaking songs on Instagram. They, they post a song on Instagram, they have 10,000, 50,000 followers that listen to it and then look for it, and that's how you break it. So we are continually having to update how we work together. Oh, no. And I think, to Aldo's point, education is key, right? Everybody that goes into any other job has to do training, has to get a certificate, a degree, or some sort of qualification. People think they can come into the music industry and not read and not study anything. It's not going to work. You've got to understand the back end of the music industry. You've got to read. You've got to research. You've got to understand that, okay, when I upload to YouTube, what happens? What do I need to register for? Do I need a publisher or don't I need a publisher? Do I need a manager or do I not need one? Sometimes you don't even need a record label. So you need to research and understand for yourself what you need to gain and learn and, and know about the music um, ecosystem. And I think too many people think, I'll just make a song and I'm going to make money. It's not that easy. Mm. It's not that easy. So you many have to read, you have to research. And if you take the time to learn, there are many ways to make money. But if you're lazy, you're not going to make the money. Yeah, mm. true. I do. So thank you, Sipa. I mean, I know that this, this is something we can talk about forever. I'm actually not quite sure how much time we've got left. I think um, we have 34 minutes. Sorry? Seconds. 34 minutes. That we minute. still got 34 minutes. Wow. That's, that's not right. Okay, that's, that doesn't <laughs> seem right. right? Wow. No, we've, I think we've got about six minutes. Someone yeah. tell me. Um, Aldo, I want to come back to you. Um, and I'm going to move away from YouTube. Oh, no, let's not move away from YouTube. This <laughs> is the YouTube away channel. From, and I want to just like go, go into now. our continent and talk about, I mean, we, we understand that there's a lot of layers and a lot of understanding that needs to happen um, in terms of... Th the one thing that I also noticed, and I mean, again, probably controversial, but the DSPs, that's the digital, the, the streaming services, uh, people are not resonating and not really subscribing to these services due to the fact that there are credit card yeah. challenges, right? So the, in, the, 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 the infiltration of these international DSPs are really, I mean, it's slow, it's a slow growth. Maybe a little more skewed in Nigeria, I think Nigeria has the biggest followers in terms of Spotify and Apple, but the rest of Africa, we're not seeing a massive growth. We're seeing a massive growth in YouTube, but let's talk about, is this an opportunity for, a, for Africa to have its own stream music streaming service. I find that, I mean, here's some little bit of statistics I also read is like, and again, Sipo, sorry, this is like, but 90%, 10 90% of the music sold on digital streaming platform is sold by 10% of an artist base, right? That's the current. IFPR, Probably so I can't be wrong, right? That, that means only 10% of artists, and I guess it's the top layer of artists, are earning the money that they should from streaming revenue. So I want to look inside this and say, is this not an opportunity? Because always, everybody, whenever you're having to do, do a deal, and I feel that I'm looking at, but if you had a, a move to where there is a bigger focus on local content, when, wherever, whatever the territory, Nigeria, Nigeria, Uganda, Uganda, and there was a payment gateway, because I believe the payment gateway is an issue. People can't, mm. to navigate how you do through airtime or whatever the case is. 
I'm going to ask you all to just wrap up because we're coming what, with that thought in terms of navigation. But I want to start with you and your experience in, in, in the industry and moving to content. So I, I'm not really clear what the question is. Cause is there an opportunity to create, whether it's a TV channel or a music streaming service on the continent that is for the continent, by the continent, with our rules? <laughs> That's not YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> you guys can I, I think, first and I'll come at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, and I think this is what this panel is all about. Yeah. Right? Um, it's called Creative Nexus Africa because we need to figure out things for ourselves. Um, my view about everything local first, then global later. Everything has to be local first. And I think that is the problem that we're facing is that we always think about this big international stuff b before facing the local stuff, right? Uh, is there an opportunity for a local platform? Definitely. Uh, when you look at the numbers, the numbers tell you clearly that there isn't a lot that these international DSPs are doing. When you think of um, uh, uh, M uh, what do you call it? Apple numbers, I, I think it's Spotify. Spotify is actually, actually quite new. Apple numbers is less than 2 million subscribers in the whole of Africa. Am I correct? Yeah. Maybe less than that. Yeah. 2 million, yeah. and there are 1.2 billion Billions. Africans. 70% uh, of that are below the ages of 35. So that shows you clearly that there's not, they're not even scratching the surface whatsoever. Two million, for context, is a small local government in Lagos State, which is the smallest state in landmass in Nigeria, by the way, one of the smallest states. So you need to think about how small that number is. But when you look at like, what the power of the music is, the, 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 the top 50 or so uh, Afrobeat artists, African artists have over two, a, a billion followers on social media. Mm. So if it's just two million people, that shows that there isn't really that much of a connection. So there's a local opportunity. The second problem that we have is with fiber, with internet, it's very expensive. Um, even to get Wi-Fi is a big deal, right? For the bigger companies because it helps. But I'm glad that we have Universal here, um, which is the biggest record label in the world. Mm. What can Universal do for us to make sure that there's a local empowerment component so that people can actually earn and make money locally. What can, and, and YouTube and Google, you guys are the same company, literally. I, and I hear that Google is doing, yeah, you guys are, no, no, YouTube and Google? Yes. yes. Good, you guys are. Well, I'm Google, I work for uh, yeah, Oh, great, <laughs> amazing, good, this is amazing. So Google has a problem. I Googled that Google has a problem, <laughs> uh, has a project around 